We have good times. We have bad times. There are ups and downs in life. This song celebrates that through it all, through the ups, through the downs, we can give glory to the Lord because he's going to take care of us. No matter what this world throws at us, we can bless the name of Jesus. Daniel Dennis's message this morning is from his sermon series, Hope for Tomorrow, Help for Today. This morning's is entitled, Hope, Holiness, and Harmony. Again, 1 Peter chapter number 2, verses 4 through 10. Let's stand as we read God's word. Please read aloud with me. The words are behind me on the overhead or follow along in your Bibles. Once again, we're in 1 Peter chapter number 2, verses 4 through 10. To whom coming as unto a living stone... Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also is it contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which ye believe, he is precious, but unto them which believe disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the world, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed." But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Thank you. You may be seated. song about Jesus Christ, highest forever and ever. This morning, if we don't do anything else, we need to lift up Jesus Christ. We need to exalt Him. As you have your Bibles, keep it open there to 1 Peter chapter number 2. This morning, we're going to look at the Scriptures. We're going to see three things. We're going to see hope, holiness, and harmony. As I thought about that, and Peter begins to write, and over and over again, he's saying it all through chapter number one, and chapter number two, 
that there is hope, and that hope is Jesus Christ. I was reading in um, the Parade magazine, and um, they were doing a follow-up article from about seven years ago. And a gentleman by the name of Eugene Land, and I didn't know who he was, but he was asked to come and speak seven years ago to a sixth grade class. And he was, there was 59 sixth graders, and he was asked to come and talk to them, and they lived in East Harlem. What could I say, he thought to himself, to these sixth graders that live in East Harlem? So I began to do a little bit of research on who they were, what their backgrounds were, what, what, was, what was it a little bit about. He wanted to know a little bit more about them. And he found out that really over 50% of all the students in this school dropped out. So he thought, I'm going to talk about stay in school. Well, that's a simple topic. But he said, how can I make that real to them? So when he got there at school, he admonished them. And then he went on and he says, if you will stay in school, I will pay the college tuition for every one of you. If you read what the sixth graders had to say after that, they, one said, for the first time, I had hope. Why, my outlook on life changed after he said that, another one. Another one said, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. Another one said, it was a golden feeling. I'd love to tell you that now that those sixth graders are in college, that they were, all went to college. Well, 90% of them, 10% still dropped out. But 90% of them, most of the other classes were 50% or less. And now 90%. Why? Yes, because someone invested, but because someone gave them hope. Peter is going to talk about that. We have hope. As we come to church and we bring our burdens and tomorrow we, or tonight we think, well, i got to pick up my burdens and go on. No, we don't. We look to the hope that Jesus Christ. He says, I want to carry your burdens. I want to be your God. I want to do special things in your life. And this morning, he is going to give us four vivid pictures of the church. Why would we even come to church? This morning, I'm not going to give a lot of other illustrations because the illustrations are right here in the scriptures. Four pictures of the church. Now, we looked at it last week in a little different area, but we see in verse number two, he says, As newborn babes that desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. We are children of the same family. We're a church. We're children of the same family. We're children of God. Now, verse four and five, we're going to continue to look on. It says in verse four, To whom coming as unto a living stone, Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as living, lively stones are living stones are built up a spiritual house. Here we see he's saying that we are stones in the same building. Not only are we children in the fa same family, but we are uh, stones in the same building. And who is the chief stone? Who is the cornerstone? That stone is none other than Jesus Christ. Peter gives a description of Jesus Christ as a stone, a living stone. Why is he a living stone? Because he came out of the grave. He's not dead. He's alive. In fact, right here, Peter is just quoting the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter number 28, verse number 16. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Jesus Christ is is chosen of God. He's the sure foundation. It says here in Isaiah that he was rejected of man, and he was, wasn't he? He came as the Messiah. He came, and what did the world do? They rejected him. They stumbled over him. They said, surely that can't be our Messiah. And though he was rejected by man, Jesus Christ 
was exalted by God. In both of these verses, it uses the word precious. To God, Jesus Christ is precious. Maybe if you're taking some notes, you just write that verse down. That'd be something to think on this week. How is Jesus Christ precious to God? And if he's precious to God, shouldn't he be precious to me? Maybe you just make a list. How is God precious to me? Boy, that would do us some good. To begin to see God's perspective. God says Jesus is precious. Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter number 18, when he first mentions the church, he says, I will build my church. It's God's church. This is not yours and my church. This is God's church. This is Jesus' church. He is our cornerstone. But you and I believers, it says, we are living stones, part of this building. What does that mean? When you and, you and I accepted Christ as our Savior, we were stones that we were taken out of that sin. We were given new life. We have been give, given life in Jesus Christ. And we are placed in the building of the church. Why, some people look at the church today and say, boy, that's not very pretty. There's bad things going on. Look at all those stones. They don't look right. But to Jesus and to God, when they look down, they see something that is beautiful. Each time we, someone trusts Christ as their Savior, they are placed, cemented by the grace of Jesus Christ, into the building, into the church. Let me tell you, because of that, what a privilege to be part of the church. Amen. It's a privilege. You think, well, I get to sing in the choir. They ought to be, you know, um, choir director over there, Sarah. You, you better take better, good care of me because, you know, it's a privilege to have me in the choir. You guys are laughing because it wouldn't be a privilege to have me in the choir. I get that. But as we serve, it's a privilege to be part of Thomas Road Baptist Church. And when we take it lightly, what do we focus on? Not on the privilege, not that we're a stone in the church, but we look at ourselves. So look at who am I? Boy, God couldn't do anything without me. No, it's a privilege to be part of this. We are privileged to be part of his church. And we belong to each other. We're, we're part of this church. And together, we belong to Christ. What does it say here? We are stones in the same building, and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Verses 5 through 9, it goes on and tells us that we are a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. We can hear it. We, um, we sometimes use it as the priesthood of the believer. What does that mean? Well, it goes back to the Old Testament, and we can begin to see the picture of what it is. In the Old Testament period, God picked special people. He picked a special tribe of the tribe of Israel to be the priest. That was the tribe of Levite. And they were individuals that had the privilege of leading Israel to the presence of God. There was the outer court in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. And there was the holy place. And certain priests were chosen to go to the holy place. But only once a year, and only by the high priest, could that priest go into the holiest of holies. It was so sacred that a rope was tied around his ankle. There were bells on the bottom of his garment so that while he was in the holiest of holies, he was meeting with God. He was offering the sacrifices for the children of Israel for their sins. There on the altar, if there was no more sound, they couldn't go in and get him. All they could do is if he were to die, because he came there in the holiest of holies, they would just yank on the rope and drag him back out, because it was a serious thing. Let's think about that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 says, Brethren, have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You need to have some boldness. I need to have some boldness to enter into that holiest of holy place because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He died for you. It's not because of me, but because of what he did. 
Um, in 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 5, it says, We have the mediator, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Because he is alive, he intercedes for us. That means we ought to live our lives as priests. You are a priest of God. Think about that a moment. You are a priest. And although you may come to me and say, Pastor, will you pray with me? I'm going to have surgery. And we'll pray together. And there's nothing wrong with that. But your prayers get heard just as much as my prayers get heard when we come to the holy place of God asking for forgiveness of our sins, coming with clean hands to Him. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you are a priest. You have the privilege to serve. In the Old Testament, you had to be born a Levite. If you weren't born a Levite, you couldn't. And even those that were born a Levite, many of them would never have an opportunity to serve in the holy place or Definitely not in the Holy of Holies. And yet God says, you have the privilege to come directly to me. As priests today, why, we come together and we worship God and we pray together. What a privilege. Not only a privilege, what a responsibility. You are a priest. You are a holy priest to your life. What does it mean to be a holy priest? Well, in the Old Testament, it meant that you would take sacrifices and they would be offered on the altar, wouldn't they? And they would be burned up. In the New Testament, we don't do that. But we are to offer sacrifices here in this verse. So what kind of sacrifices? Romans chapter number two, 12, verse number 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. What should you give to God? Everything that you have. Your whole body. Everything that you think. Everything that you do. Everything that you are is God's. And you give it back to Him. Pastor, I don't think I like that. I like a little bit of my own. I want to make my own choice. We live in America. We're individuals. We get to make our own choices. Not if we're believers. It's Christ's choice. We give him a living sacrifice. The verse goes on and says, Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and it's reasonable for you to give your whole life to him. Every day of the week. That's reasonable. That's not unreasonable. He died for you. You and I were on our way to hell. And Jesus Christ came and left heaven and died on the cross. He took our sins so that we could go to heaven. And when he took our sins and we put our faith and trust in him, he took all of that. We did nothing. It's reasonable for us to give it back to him. So what does that mean, Pastor? That means I come to church every day. That means I just come to church and sit back here in the auditorium every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, that's not what he's talking about. It's your life. When you wake up in the morning, you say, today, my life is yours, God. I want you to direct it. I want you to, to help me not only make the right choices, but go to the right places, but to do what I should, say the right things. Today, this is your life. Lord, I give you control. I'll read my Bible. I'll pray. I will do my life as you would want me to do it. And on Monday, you start your day that way. And you go to work. And things don't go so well. And you want to complain to everybody, but you don't complain because, you know what? It's not your life. If it's your life, you have everything to complain about. But it's not your life. It's God's life. And God wants you to have a bad day. He wants the boss to be angry with you. He wants, you know, the things to not to be the way that you think they ought to be. You say, that's okay. God, this is the way you want it. And you keep a smile on your face. And a couple days later, after this happens day after day, the boss goes, what's wrong with you? Something's different with you. I know, you know, I saw that person kind of 
scream at you. You work in retail and they didn't like the way you had to, that you had to stand up for the, the company and you had to do your, your responsibility. But you still had a smile on your face and you didn't go back and complain to the other people about how bad of a person you had to deal with. What's different about you? Well, it's nothing of me. But I tell you what, this morning I got up and I gave God my life. And it just makes all the difference. I can have joy no matter what. That's what it means when it says in Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Whether we're a teenager, an adult, a senior citizen, we go through life and we give God our life. Why? Because we are a priest. And here we come to the altar every day and we give it to God and say, God, Whatever I have, I give to you. And so all during the daytime, is my work good or bad? Why, it's good because I don't say and want to do bad things. I don't want to be mean because it's good things in my life. Um, I don't look at my things, and this is my life, and that's my church life. It's all God's. This is my money. These are my things. These are my cars. These are my possessions. No, they're all God's. You want to drive my car? All right. You know why? Because I don't care. It's God's car. Now, we, we laugh sometimes. I like cars. You guys know that. I, you guys, that doesn't take long to be around me. And I like to play with cars. I don't like to drive the same car forever. And I like to figure out what. Um, and so when someone bangs into your car, you go, oh. You know, you'd, been, you'd spent 10 hours polishing it and making it nice. And then somebody bangs into it. And then you kind of pull off the road and you think, well, they're not going to stop. They won't have insurance. Why? Because I probably didn't get my heart in the right attitude and my sacrifice. But you know what? They pull over and they talk to you a little bit. And then you begin to think, not only is it a bad day for me, but it's not a very good day for them. Uh, I didn't hit them. That would have made it worse. They hit me. God, you better help me get my act a little bit right. This isn't my car. This is your car. If you want scratches on this car, God, then let's have scratches on the car um, because it's your car. And I don't know what you like. You like other things. You take care of other things. And when it gets scratched up, you get angry. Don't get angry. God wants to know, is it yours or is it his? And it's his if we're his priest. It's a priesthood of believer. The truth is God wanted the people of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. For the rest of the world to look at Israel and their spiritual influence would transform the other nations around them to God. But instead of being an influence for God, what were the children of Israel? They were influenced. They looked at the other worlds and says, we want those things. They adopted the sinful practices of the world. And then what did God do? He had to discipline them for their idolatry, for their sinful behavior. You and I are priests. In the same way, we can look around and say, oh, I like all of these other things. No, they're not for me. I'm a priest. I'm different. What does the verse say? It's a peculiar people. doesn't mean odd. You're not to be odd. Everybody's supposed not to look at you and go, I don't want to be around him. He's just an oddball. No, they don't say it. But you are different. You are a peculiar person. You are um, separate. Um, you are a priest. We may maintain a separation from the world. That doesn't mean that we don't partake. That means that we're not in the world. We are of the world, but we don't let the world get to be part of us. There's a separation between worldly things, but it's not an isolation. We go to work. We're in the midst of it. You hear someone curse at work. And I've told you this before. One of the first jobs I ever had, I worked at the Indiana Senate, and I had to go through several, I think it was a third or fourth interview. And um, the... Um, Senator and the Secretary of the Senate sat down and said, I'm 21 years old, and all the kids from all the universities have been applying for, um, I think it was uh, 12 positions. And so um, 500,000 um, applications, I forget it was, and I know I got down to this last one. And now I'm sitting in front of these two. And I, I'm just kind of holding my breath a little bit. I really wanted this job. I wanted to do this. 
And the first question they looked across me and they said, Daniel, they, they had looked at my resume. I had gone to a Christian school. I had gone to a Christian college. And so they said, if someone cusses at the Senate, what are you going to do? Man, I, I'm sitting here thinking they're going to ask some hard question about the Senate or something else. What am I going to do if someone cusses? Um, I, I kind of stammered. I went, well, you don't expect me to cuss back because I'm not going to do that. But I'm probably just going to walk away unless it's something. It's, that's what they might do, but that's not part of my life. And um, I don't know any better way to tell you. I was 21. I didn't know what to. And I can't remember any other questions they asked. We spent another 20 minutes. I just remember that first question. The world looks at you and goes, what are you going to do when someone cusses? When someone treats you wrong? They don't know how to handle it. But the truth was, later on I found out that one of the senator, one of the senators sitting there, he was a believer. He was a priest. And he wanted to show the other fella that as priests we're in the world, but we're not we don't not isolated from the world. We can live in the world. We're not isolated. We have contact without contamination. Let's not be contaminated with the world. One of the things that we're doing on Sunday nights, and I showed you the short video, and let me just give you one more plug to come back tonight. If you're a teenager, the, we live in a world that wants to get us to, in all different directions. And they say they want to help us. If you're educated, then you can have a good life. But that's not true. If you have a lot of money, then you'll be happy. And that's not true. And we look at, just in the last couple of weeks, some young people that are just going through life and all of a sudden get mixed up with a group that says, you know what you need to do with your life? You need to set bombs around people and blow them up. That will make your life meaningful. And you and I go, scratch our heads and going, that is odd. That doesn't make any sense. No one in their right mind would do that. And yet, young people do this. They get their minds transformed and changed. Part of this Truth Project begins to give us the answer. Why do I believe the Bible? Why do I even know that there's a Jesus? We need to know these answers. And as young people and teenagers, we need to know this answer. As new believers and as Christians, sometimes we need to review it. We've maybe heard it, but we forgot about it. And when someone asks you, why do you believe? Well, I just believe the Bible. I always have. My parents were Christians. That's not good enough. We need to know the Bible for ourselves and in every area of our life. I encourage you, if you've got young people, if you've got teenagers, if you've got grandchildren that are now being influenced, bring them on Sunday nights for a while. They'll enjoy this. They will like it. And they will begin to understand, why should I believe the Bible? Not because mom and dad says so, but because I know it's true for myself. It's so important. As our young people get saved, they are priests just like we are, and they need to know the Bible for themselves. We are priests in the same temple. There's unity here. Let me, verses 9 and 10, let me give you the last one here. We are citizens of the same nation. Here's another picture that um, we read of, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I like that. When you're standing in light, it's not just some light. It's marvelous light. It's phenomenal light. It's wonderful light. When you're standing in darkness and sin, you think, oh, this is great. This is the way to live. No, it's not. Come, tell your friends, there is something different. There's another way to live. And living with Jesus Christ is marvelous. Living in the light. Verse number 10, which in times past were not a people, but are now a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We are citizens of the same nation. Now, there's a parallel here. And there's a contrast. Again, the, the nation of Israel, there's a parallel. They were a nation, and we as a church are like a nation. We are together. But there are contrasts here. They were disobedient. They were rebellious. And we are to, today what a chosen and unholy nation. Israel wasn't a holy nation. But you and I are to be a holy nation. It says we are a chosen generation. That's something interesting. 
There's something different when someone chooses you, when someone says, I like you, I want to be your friend. God says, I choose you. Yes, I know when we come to Christ in salvation that we have a free will and we turn to Christ, yet he chose us. In um, uh, John chapter number 15, verse 16, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You are a chosen generation. And then it says, you are a holy nation. What does that word holy mean? You are a set apart. You are set apart exclusively to God. You have your citizenship in heaven. Your citizenship isn't just as an American. We're pilgrims here. We're going to live here for a little while. But our permanent citizenship is in heaven. You are part of a holy nation. What did Israel do? They forgot that they were a holy nation. And so they began to live for themselves. They began to forget that there was supposed to be a separation between them and all the other nations around them. That they were separate. That they were distinct. And they became like all the other nations. God says right here, there is a difference between the holy and the unholy. There is a difference between the unclean and the clean. And you are a holy nation. Be holy. We are a people. Who possesses us? Christ does. Why? Because he purchased us by his blood. He purchased us. We are a holy nation. As a citizen of, an, of America, do you have some privileges? Absolutely. We have the right to assemble. We can come to church. There are countries around the world that cannot do what we are doing right now because they are part of a nation that does not allow that. We are a nation of God. And with that, we have responsibilities. We have the responsibility of telling the lost world about Jesus Christ. The word here in verse number 10, it says to show forth. To show forth means to tell others. It means to advertise. You have a responsibility to advertise that you know Christ and there's no better life than for you to follow Jesus Christ and live this life with me. That's what it means. We are God's chosen people. And because of his mercy, we are to be faithful to him. That being said, we are not living in our own, in our own land. We're living in enemy territory. We're living in this earth. And... This earth is not. We're just pilgrims. We're here. Sometimes in the Bible it talks about we're here and we have to put on the armor of God because we're in a battle. We're on enemy territory and the enemy is looking at us, watching for opportunities to move into our life and take over our life and, and, and just take us aside. No doubt some of you this last week have thought about you know, I've had a pretty bad week. And then by the time Saturday comes around after working hard all week, you didn't get much time to rest yesterday. And then Sunday morning comes around, and I normally go to church, but I'm just tired this morning. If I miss one Sunday, it's okay. And, this, and the enemy creeps in. And you're here this morning, so it doesn't work for you guys, does it? Because you're here. Amen? But you, you guys know how that comes to our own life. There's little things. It comes in and says, well, not today. We are citizens of heaven. And citizens, um, a, um, our founding father said, a nation divided will stand or will fall. A nation divided will fall. And as a citizen of heaven, and as a holy nation, citizens of heaven, we must be united. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We are one in Christ because of his mercy. We look to him. We're citizens of heaven. We're fighting for Jesus Christ. We're not fighting for ourselves. He gives us a picture here of all the time there's unity and harmony. I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with you. All those things are coming um, in our lives. But I stand next to you to encourage you, to help you. Stand shoulder to shoulder to you. Why? Not because of myself, but because... We are citizens of heaven, of this nation. We belong to the family of God. We share the same divine nature, Peter says. Then he goes on, we're living stones in the same building. We're priests serving in the same temple. We're citizens in the same heavenly homeland. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the source. And when Jesus Christ is the source, there is unity. When I'm the center, 
there is no unity. When I begin my sentence with, I think, I want, it should be my way, there is no unity. When we begin by, we want to do things Jesus' way. I want Jesus to be first in our life. Jesus needs to be first in our church. There is unity in that. Unity, though, doesn't, doesn't mean there's not diversity. You know what? When we talk about those stones in the building, the, all the stones don't look alike. There's diversity. Your children, they're not all, all alike. Some of your children like to do this, and your other children hate that, but they like to do this. And sometimes I get both of my girls together and say, let's all do this. And one will say yes, and the other will say no. They're different. And we're different here. We're not to be identical. There's diversity, but there's unity. There's not uniformity. It's like the choir singing in unison. It sounds great when they sing in unison sometimes, but we enjoy the harmony when there's the sopranos and the altos. There's the tenors and the basses, and they sing in harmony. Why? We say, that was really good. You guys just harmonize so well. That's what it is for you and I as believers. We're different. We're unique, but we get along. As I think on that, I think about how the Lord is one. Here in church, he is one. That's where it comes back to. He is the center. He is one in our lives. I began to think on that, and each month we've been memorizing a verse. Twelve important verses for us to memorize at Thomas Road Baptist Church. Twelve verses that would be crucial to our Christian life. And I've been talking to some of you, and I am so encouraged by hearing you memorize and telling others about how are you doing and, and the like. We're in Romans chapter number 10. Last month was verse number 9, and this month is verse number 10. I says, as priests, we're to advertise. How can we share the gospel? This morning you don't know Christ as your Savior. How are you supposed to be saved? Here it is, right in a nutshell, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thine heart God, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's bow our heads this morning. This morning, do you know Christ is your Savior? Why that verse, Romans 10, 9, and 10, makes it clear? You can know Christ as your Savior. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. You're here, but don't know Christ as your Savior? Why, this is the time to do that. You say, Pastor, you've talked about one in Christ. You talked about the unity. Yes, that's here at Thomas Road Baptist Church. Say, well, I like coming, but I'm not a member. Well, you ought to be a member. You ought to jump in with both feet. What does it mean to be a member of Thomas Road Baptist Church? Well, some come by baptism. When you accept Christ as your Savior and you're baptized, you become a member of Thomas Road Baptist Church when you're baptized here. Sometimes people move and have been saved and baptized in another church, and so they move their membership. They come by statement of faith saying, I know Christ is my Savior, and I have been baptized in another church of like faith, baptized by immersion, and I want to be a member of Thomas Road Baptist Church. What you said about and what Peter said of moving forward in unity, that's what I want in my life. I want to grow as a believer. I encourage you, be a member of Thomas Road Baptist Church. This morning, you may have brought some burdens. Work, family, finances. Maybe just in the quietness you want to stay in your seat and pray. There's nothing wrong with that. But maybe you'd like someone to pray with you this morning. Someone to come alongside of you and say, I'll pray with you this morning. You've got a burden. I'll help you with that burden. God wants to meet that need. Give it to God. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I don't know what God's saying to you, but as we begin to sing, I'm just going to step down front. You do as God lays on your heart. You come forward. Don't stand around. You come forward, and together we'll pray together, and we'll get these things settled with God. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much 
that we have unity, that we are stones in the building of the church, that we are priests, and we can live holy unto you, giving you our sacrifice, our life, and that we are part of a holy nation. I thank you for the pictures that we have to live for you. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. In just a moment, I'm going to ask Pastor Joel to sing a hymn of invitation. Once you're standing, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Never a point to embarrass anyone. But this morning, take an opportunity. Don't just say, I'll do it next time. This morning, God laid it on your heart. You come forward and pray. Pastor Joel. All to Jesus I surrender. verses for you this morning.